Good day, everyone. Well, uh, we see a market that uh, is certainly uh, having um, serious uh, cases of indigestion here. Um, just remarking with Gil that, uh, that this uh, market has now um, moved lower four times since December. It's, um, in other words, it likes to test uh, the current levels. If you look at the S&P 500, um, you've got uh, the S&P first down to 1972 in December, and then since then it's come close to that level. Um, right now it's, it's nearing its 200-day uh, uh, moving average, which sits at 1973. So I would expect the market to get some sort of support at that level, um, given, uh, given the overall price volume nature. This is the first time the market has actually done, you know, retested uh, four, uh, four times now um, these levels in such a short amount of time. So there's a lot of volatility going on, and volatility generally speaks badly for, um, for bull markets. Uh, when you get, it's also in stocks, when you start to see a stock top, it gets very volatile in a short span of time. And uh, the same could be said for indices. You know, and if you look back, just looking back over the S&P, uh, going, going back a you know, number of years, it's had a general rhyme and rhythm to it, looking at the weekly here, um, since uh, QE3 began in January of um, 2013, the S&P's got a, a natural manipulated rhythm where it doesn't like to sell off more than uh, really more than several percent. Um, so this is the first time that uh, the, the, the range of the uh, weekly bars has increased um, to denote that it, we're in a very sloppy, treacherous environment. Um, as far as the S&P con is concerned, uh, if you look at the Nasdaq, it's uh, it's not really looking a whole lot better. Same same kind of problem there. So um, all that's to be said that you know sidelines are a good place to be when you have a lot of volatility and and a lot of um, randomness, seeming randomness in the indices. But um, this is an important clue: the fact that we have this kind of uh, riptide environment playing out. Um, which lends credence to the model switching to a sell signal sooner than later. So um, stay tuned for, um, for, for that. Um, and as far as uh, commodities, oil, the uh, downtrend is also intact there. Um, you know, the Fed announced yesterday that uh, they see the economy turning around, but they, that's what they're programmed to say. And uh, just because they say it usually doesn't mean it's true. So with the uh, economy still faltering uh, in the U.S. and globally, um, I don't think that they really have um, much chance to really get hawkish and start uh, thinking about raising rates later this year, uh, even though that's kind of what, um, what their report implied. But I don't think they're going to be able to do it. But nevertheless, because the market took their tone as hawkish, um, we had a major high volume reversal in the major averages um, yesterday. And uh, it still seems like, uh, you know, unless the Fed's going to change its stance so quickly, I think the, um, the selling pressure in the general markets is going to continue. And, um, and the markets are tracing out a volatile uh, topping kind of pattern. So we might finally see that market correction in excess of 10% that we've been waiting for for about, uh, what, two year, over two years now. Um, other than that, uh, I think it's you know it's a stock picker's environment um, on the long and the short side, just uh, just as it has been for the last couple of years. Um, and uh, I'll leave it to Gil to uh, expound on that. Yeah, I, I think if you guys uh, who are, or if you saw the Sunday webinar, uh, stock hunting webinar, remember the conclusion I was able to draw by looking at so many charts, and we looked at a lot of charts uh, on Saturday morning and uh, the conclusion I drew is it really was not very much to sink your teeth into on the long side and so you could probably get the idea that the market's pretty feeble at that point and I think you're seeing that play out so far this week. We did talk about a couple of names on uh, Saturday that that worked out pretty well for example um, whoops, Zeltic, ZLTQ is actually making a higher high today in, in the face of a wobbly market environment. That one worked out pretty well, but it had a pocket pivot here. And you can see as it pulled in here on uh, Friday, the volume was very light. And so we looked at this. You could have bought it on Monday, and you'd be up about 10, 10 12% on that. So, you know, but I'm thinking you probably want to take a profit here. Uh, because uh, you know it's just it's that type of environment. You get a profit in something, you probably should be taking it. 
and uh, heading for the hills after that. I mean, to some extent, that is also applied on the short side. It's ma mainly like a hit-and-run environment. But what, what I think they're doing here is going to work along the lows. They bring it down, and uh, it, it starts to look ugly, and, and yet the buyers, they, they can work the buyers. And I think what's going on here is they're chipping away at support along these lows, and you're going to see this thing break. That, that's what I think. And, and it seems the action of the stock seems to at least lend some credence to that point of view. And, and as you guys know, I, I base my view of the market entirely on what stocks are doing, not what indexes are doing, because the indexes are just manipulated and screwed with and screws with your head. So uh, anyways, I hope that the webinar was helpful. And I think from the perspective of getting an idea of how I look at the market in terms of the stocks, we got a good picture that if eh, things aren't so, looking so hot. And so there's no real reason to get aggressive on the long side. Just be patient. And in the meantime, this has actually been a very nice week uh, for the short side. Yesterday was, was a beautiful day. Uh, I don't, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, I tweeted early in the day when Yahoo is somewhere above 49, around 49.50, early in the day that this looked like a short. Uh, you had all the talking heads on TV saying it was a, uh, a, you know, you had to buy the stock, it's going to 55, yeah, right. And the thing's breaking down. You're basically down to the 200 day. And if you look at the, the weekly chart here, you can see that you're, you hit, you got pretty close to the 40 week. In my view, I take profits. You're right on top of this base now, so I take profits in that, you know. Somebody tweeting back to me earlier, you know, should they take profits? I was like, you know what, if, if you can't figure it out yourself, you shouldn't be putting on the trade. And you guys know how I feel about that. People who rely on someone to, uh, to tell them what to do, uh, you're just showing a sign of, of being very weak and feeble-minded as far as I'm concerned. And so if you put on a position like Yahoo yesterday on the short side, you know, you're probably doing pretty well. It was a nice, like, almost a 20% drop in two days. So even on that basis, to me, it becomes uh, very much a profit-taking situation as it comes down and gets close to the 200-day uh, the and also more, more, uh, much closer to the 40-week line. And remember, you got to watch both charts. So use your deliberative mind to uh, discern what's going on on several time frames. And then also we like to look at the, uh, the, the 620 chart, which can give you some clues as to what's going on. But I think in general, this market's looking pretty grim, and all they're doing is bouncing along these lows. I don't know if they shoot back to the upside, but you are sort of triangulating a bit here, and maybe something's going to break uh, one way or the other. But you, here also you see the S&P bouncing along the lows. It's getting close to the 200-day. The Dow is in a similar position, so not what I would call uh, you know an optimal environment, at least on the long side. And I think if you're hit and run, uh, you're hit and run oriented on the short side. Uh, I think you can make some money and just kind of see how things pan out. But you can see they're getting the market going. They got yeah. I think you'll just see the usual morning volatility like we saw yesterday, and then we broke. Dr. K, I didn't really see the uh, Fed as being hawkish, they seem to imply that for now they could just take their time about uh, raising interest rates. And of course you, you have the continual Orwellian line that, oh, the economy is strong, jobs growth is, is robust, and yet you have a, a situation where interest rates are still at zero. So the economy is so strong that they have to keep interest rates at zero. I kind of read it that way. And the market, I thought, might respond positively to that, but instead it sold off hard. And I think that, that tells you that you know QE and this just continual pumping uh, money into the financial system, printing money, printing fiat money, is, is losing traction. It may continue to lose traction. And uh, notice gold coming in, so you know, they don't see much going on there. And for the most part, it, you know, it, it's just hard to say that there's going to be any traction in, in QE, uh, continuing QE or QE4. So anyways, I'm just watching this thing rally here a little bit. But it looks to me like just going to bounce it around, and then we'll get sort of some sort of sense of the final direction later in the day, which has kind of been the pattern. Uh, I don't see any questions. You guys must not have anything you want to look at. But uh, some things I'm looking at, you can see uh, Visa. We talked about this. 
It has a potential short. Last week on the rally into the 50-day, you can see that's breaking down. Uh, some other ones, uh, let's see. VMware is one I hit on earnings. They rallied it up to the 50-day uh, uh, after hours on Tuesday after the close, and then the thing broke down. That's undercut these lows. Cover that. Take a profit. Uh, let's see. Splunk. Now breaking down. You can see, uh, hold on a second here. Let me. Make that a little bigger. Yeah, I think I just think they're going to jerk this thing around for a while, and then it's going to blow to the downside. So it's just a matter of hanging out. And if you're going to short, you pick your spots. But you can see there's a fractal head and shoulders here on Splunk, and now it's breaking down through what had been the lows of this pattern. You're undercutting the lows. I think you're probably headed to this low. They come out with earnings later in the month. I think it's shorter ball and rallies into the 50, uh, 200 day moving average. So that's what I would be watching for. I think uh, you look at Workday for example. Workday was shorter ball up here at the 200 day it stalled out then you gap down. You actually could have shorted the gap down move because even yesterday you had a little blip up to the 20 day and now you're breaking down. It looks like you're headed for uh, lower lows. They come out with earnings at the end of the month. So you know, here you can see sort of a fractal head and shoulders. It shows up here on the weekly chart. But you see how ugly that pattern looks? It looks like a big sloppy, I wouldn't necessarily call it a pod because it doesn't have that straight down, straight up symmetry that you look for in a pod formation. But it is a sloppy, choppy cup with handle. Tried to break out here and failed. And once it fails here through the 50 day, now it becomes shorter. But last place to hit it on the upside that I think was really optimal was right at the 50 day moving average here. And uh, boom, we go to the downside. You see how they get this thing going to the upside? They get everybody excited. They think it's a low. Now we're up. We went up like 40-something points on the Dow. NASDAQ almost got to unch, but now we're starting to reverse back to the downside. I really think this market's under distribution. And you see it in the stocks, uh, and that's really where it is. It's not necessarily in, in the indexes, but by the same token, you see, uh, even though this is blue, most of the upside volume where it's been... Uh, getting hit on heavier volume has been to the downside. So you're basically seeing wave of selling, then a blip to the upside. IBD goes to market and confirmed uptrend, and then when they break it to the downside, they go to uptrend under pressure. I think uptrend's on vacation myself, or maybe out to lunch, but in any case, it breaks to the upside, uptrend is resumed. And uh, the, the bottom line is they don't really know what's going on, and so what they do is they hedge. Because if they say uptrend under pressure and it breaks, they can say, well, the uptrend was under pressure. But if it keeps rallying, then the oil is still an uptrend. So, you know, they're, they're trying to play, play it out of both sides of their mouth. And I, I think net-net, it just shows that they can't figure it out. The MDM is having some trouble figuring it out. But the stocks are telling you everything you need to know. And you can just operate on that basis alone. Um, this Zeltic is up a buck 81 now I'm watching. Um, let's see. I want to look at some others here. Google, we looked at this over the weekend. You see how they rallied all the way past the 50-day moving average here, and now it just blows apart. And you see, when you're watching something rally, it, you know, and this looks to me like a big, here's a, a late-stage cup with handle, not really a pot, it's not deep enough, uh, so I call it a late-stage cup with handle, and then it becomes a gooey kablooey here where it blows apart off the peak, violates the 50-day uh, and the 200-day, and then rallies back up into the 50 or the 10-week here which is, is in here. This is the rally. And a lot of times as the stock's coming down, you notice it undercuts the slow, rallies back up, but it finds resistance near these highs. So, so one thing to watch for is if you're watching a short sale target stock rally past the 50-day moving average, then, then look for the next possible zone of resistance on the pattern. So in other words, the, a prior high here serves as resistance in this case. And I think that becomes fairly actionable on that basis right then and there. And so you can hit that thing here, and it comes down the last four days. That's been a very good short. Netflix uh, looking pretty grim here as it gets whacked. But it's coming off the, the peak here, so it's run up sharply. Maybe it comes down to the 200-day. Maybe it doesn't. But I thought this was a short yesterday. I was trying to test it uh, three days ago. got stopped out pretty quickly because it just kept going. And then I flipped and went long, and that worked for a trade. But it's, you know, they're just swing trades on the long side as far as I'm concerned. 
and potentially it could come into play as a very large and ugly head and shoulders formation. This is the top of the right shoulder. Now, what do you notice here where it's finding resistance? This is near the peak of the left shoulder. So uh, that's a potential spot of resistance because you have no real reference points on the moving averages because you're so far above the 200-day, the 10-day, the 20-day, and the 50-day, and you could throw on the 65-day exponential, but you're way beyond any uh, reference points in terms of potential uh, a breakdown, in other words, a confirmed breakdown. I guess back to the 200-day, that would be some confirmation, but the only way to really test this is by looking at it in the manner that I described with Google, which is if it goes past moving averages and you still see a pattern potentially forming, I think now you could consider this somewhat pod-like. This is somewhat pod-like, and it did eventually fail, but it, it formed a little head and shoulders before it failed. But you can see the resistance level uh, right at the top of the left shoulder. So some other names. Uh, I think Amgen. Um, I'm actually, I shorted that one this morning. Rallied up to the 65-day exponential this morning, so I hit it pretty big. It's coming in now. This looks like potentially, you see a little compact head and shoulders here. It's a, definitely a late-stage base failure, and it's had a pretty good run here on the weekly chart. And you see the break on heavy volume yesterday after earnings, and now it's uh, heading lower. I think you're definitely heading through these lows down around 151, 92, and then eventually maybe you get there depending on how far the market goes down. Um, TripAdvisor looks shortable here, but come out with earnings. You can see this big, here again is a, a somewhat pod-like, but not really deep enough, but you call it just a late-stage cup with handle that's improper because you have no real handle here. Tries to break out, makes a marginal high, and then blows apart. This thing looks like it's going lower, but I think you're going to have to wait until earnings to really figure that one out. In the meantime, uh, it looks pretty grim and looks like it's going lower. I shorted this one a couple, three days ago around the 20-day and been working it on the way down. LRCX was a good short this morning. They opened the thing up. It looked kind of weak to me because you're, you're starting to break down from this breakout attempt to new highs. And you chop around, you come in and see again, here's the move past the 50-day, but it finds resistance at this peak here, okay? So that's a very important principle to keep in mind when you're shorting, okay? And I've covered this with Google and uh, what was the other stock that I covered that with? I forget. Uh, but in any case... You can see how you get a big outside reversal. That's probably headed for the 200-day moving average. Uh, let's see some more of these. Illumina. This stock doesn't know what it wants to do. It tries to break out, reverses, comes back into the base. Bouncing off the 10-day, my guess is you're going to see it roll over again. So I think you want to uh, keep your eyes on this. It could become shortable. It's a very late-stage formation. You had a big move, and here's this sort of ugly cup. You call it a ladle with the long handle. And then you form another base and you're trying to break out. So you've got to watch for this one to fail because it's, I think it's on the verge of doing so. And one option would be to short it here using the high of the day as a quick stop if you wanted to test a short in that position or in that stop rather. So, you know, in some cases you're testing them and you see if they, if they don't work, you just get out of the way and bail out and look to come back in. And that's what I'll do. And I'll do that over and over again uh, with the stock before it finally blows and I, I hit it. Yahoo, you see it's rallying a little bit. But again, like I said a little while ago, I think it's uh, it's probably going to bounce. Here's Alexion. Now notice here, here's a big ugly cup with handle. you got a rally pushing into the 10-week moving average today, 50-day. You see that installing. So they came out with earnings. They actually came out with pretty good earnings. And then they proceeded to uh, run up. They reversed and ran higher. I would watch this thing. I think it may be topping. This is a big, ugly ladle with handle sort of formation, and, if, and you've already broken down through the 10-week line. You're rallying into the 50-day. That's a very nice uh, spot for uh, a clear resistance uh, or stop, you know, a, a clear point of resistance where you can set your stop. So um, I'm trying to keep an eye on the market here because I'm seeing some things I want a short rally. And... Uh, some other names I'm watching come down that I'm sure, like F5. I uh, shorted this one yesterday. You see the gap down, uh, and then you rally to the peak of the range yesterday. I thought that was a short spot. You could use this high here as a stop. It never got past that. Now it's coming down with volume picking up yesterday. Probably going to test this low. That's what it looks like to me. So that's one I'm short right now. 
Uh, Facebook, I haven't done anything with that. It was good for a quick uh, hit today. You could have gotten some downside on it if you shorted early in the day, but it's flopping around. Now, all the analysts on the planet love the stock. You know, and, and all the planet, uh, analysts on the planet loved BABA back when it was up here. And this thing just blowing to pieces. So when everybody loves something, you know, I was watching uh, this Fast Money show yesterday. I, I think they should call it Dumb Money, but that's just my opinion. Uh, because they said Yahoo was going to 55 and it was a sure thing. And BABA was a sure thing when it was around 120. It was going to 200. And uh, Facebook is a long-term core holding and you got to have, Facebook and blah, 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 and uh, I want to see if they're actually right. And now, they're coming after it because, uh, you know, they, they love the stock, but I think they're a little late, you know. Uh, institutions buying it now are a little bit late. You had the Bible gap up way back here. You had a big run. Several bases have formed. You actually failed on this breakout, okay, and now you're rallying into the 50-day moving average. That's a short point doesn't strike me as rocket science, uh, and if it fails uh, or pushes back through the high of the day, which is uh, 77, 76, you just set a quick stop there, and you got nothing really to worry about. So, see, they're getting the market going because they can, I think, and they get it bouncing very nicely. <laughs> Somebody says, it is fast money. Just watch how fast the money disappears. Another name we talked about on the long side is LCI. So I talked about it right here. You have this little pocket pivot here. You're drawing up on the pullback in the 50-day moving average, and then, boom, it gaps out because everybody uh, or the company comes out and announces uh, great uh, earnings, pre-announces earnings, and uh, the stock gaps up, and it's actually holding up pretty well. So anyways, let's see. Going to look around here. Somebody says, it looks like there are no leaders left. It doesn't seem like there's very many. So, you know, I, I take it, that, that's my cue, basically. And I don't care what the index is doing in the short term. I think that 2015 is going to be a bear market year. So if I'm wrong, you guys can, you know, needle me on that. But uh, that's what it looks like to me. Let's go through some questions. Somebody says, by the way, the stock screen scan webinars are very helpful. Yeah, I'll do those from time to time when I feel like it. But you know, I have a life, too, and uh, I like my weekends. Uh, but I'll do them when I think it's relevant or when I think it's helpful. And I really thought this weekend you really weren't seeing anything that was all that actionable on the long side. And I think that was giving you a clue about the market. So, anyways, let's see. Uh, some stocks people want to talk about. Let's go. FNV, Franco, Nevada. Uh, I don't know. This doesn't. I wouldn't buy this one. So I don't. You know, it's just a piece of junk. How about? Uh, let's see. RGLD. Oh, you want to buy gold stocks? I, I wouldn't play with that either. I wouldn't mess with gold stocks. There's really no reason to be buying gold stocks. You know, if the price of gold is going up, maybe they go up, but it doesn't look like it to me. And I think if you get into a, a really bad market environment where they start selling everything, then what's going to happen is they're going to take every asset class down, and that includes precious metals. So I'm really not going to go there on the long side. I don't think you should either. And so you want, you know, gold, gold is very choppy, but precious metals have been uh, safe haven buying. But yeah. uh, things get worse, then all you have to do is look at 2008 to see how far uh, everything fell. Right. Good point, Dr. K. And, and Silver Wheaton, you know, why would you want to buy that? And I, I don't even know if I'd short it, but I sure as hell wouldn't buy it. So, you know, i got to tell you, if you're looking at these patterns and you need someone to tell you whether these are good or bad, you need to work on your chart reading abilities, okay? So, and I, I think it's valuable. If you ask a question, I can identify a weakness that you're showing based on your question. I'm going to point it out for your own good and for the benefit of the group because I think it also helps people. But, you know, think about it. If you've got to ask somebody about this pattern, then you're really kind of clueless when it comes to reading a chart pattern. There's nothing here that tells you you want to be long, and I might add that there's nothing here that tells me I necessarily want to be short because these aren't big leaders that have the potential to blow, blow apart, okay? Uh, let's see. Somebody says, I see BABA on the RCB regula regulatory circuit breaker. Yeah, it's looking pretty grim. 
It's got an R on it. No, I don't see an R on it right now. But yeah, I, that thing's death warmed over. And I feel sorry for the people who are dumb enough to, you know, you buy it on the breakout that IBD is blaring all over the paper and they tell you, oh, it's up 20%. You've got to hold it eight weeks. And if you held it eight weeks, let's see, once it's up here, uh, eight weeks, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you would have held it to here and watch all your gains disappear. And if you're still holding it, you're getting your head ripped off. So, uh, you know, again, that eight-week rule, it is, it's basically a lie. And I think, and it, it really disturbs me that it's pitched as some uh, a solid, you know, valid rule. Don't, didn't that bother you, Dr. K? You know, um, <laughs> well, you, you're talking about the, uh, the eight-week so hold rule. rule, you know, the eight-week hold rule. What did you say? The eight-week hold rule where if a stock goes up more than 20% in two to three weeks after breakout, you have to hold it for eight weeks. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been on record many times, um, you know, on, on these types of rules that are just trying to put everything in a box, you know, where you have confined fixed variables. Um, just goes, it flies in the face of uh, market context. You know, you can't have hard and fast rules if things are contextual. And the thing is, is that everyone likes everything in a nice wrap neat little little box but uh the market doesn't work like that life doesn't work like that no. so if you're going to have <laughs> uh, these restrictive um you know uh, fixed variables because of for the sake of simplicity you're also going to end up uh diminishing your returns as a consequence of needing those types of training wheels in, in your trading yeah i think they're they're worse than uh training wheels i, I think it's a hand grenade they put in your hand and they pull the trigger and, and tell you you got to hold this and then it blows up in your hand uh, let's go to some more questions. AKRX looking like it has rallied right up into resistance where it failed on heavy volume on November 6th using today's high as a stop. I guess you want to short this thing. Uh, well, if you're looking at the pattern, it, it's something of an improper double bottom, so you don't get the shakeout through the lows. Uh, I don't know if there's any. There's no pocket pivots in the pattern. Do they come out with earnings pretty soon here? Maybe. Yeah, that might be. Uh, I mean, that might be a short. But it's not displaying any huge weakness just yet. But it does have some flaws. You got this big break on the downside, which is telling you that's the initial, uh, say, point of uh, exit for a lot of institutions who might have owned the stock. And so that's looking pretty grim. But I'm not sure I'd, I'd short it. So Twitter coming out with earnings, I think, next week. Uh, we've talked about Twitter many times. You can see the new, uh, this is like a not, it's sort of a fractal head and shoulders, but it's more a secondary head and shoulders that forms on the left side of the pod. We went into some detail on this uh, a few webinars ago, or maybe last week or the week before, I forget. But it's breaking for lows. It's going to the lows, okay? This stock is going to 20, I think. I don't think there's anything there. Yeah, I use Twitter, but my guess is not going to be around that much longer. And at some point, I may have to switch to something else. But uh, in terms of tweeting to people in real time and just spewing my thoughts. And uh, I, I think it's going lower. But the trick here is, again, you see it rallies past the 50-day moving average here. But the resistance is seen, It's in this case, at the 65-day exponential, but also the high uh, of this rally above the 50-day as well. So fake book. Yeah, we're, lo we're looking at that already. Yeah. Um, I think it's shortable using the 50-day as your stop or the high of today as a stop. Uh, the overall pattern, like I said, it, it's it's a base failure already. So, you, you know, that's probably an indication that it's uh, not happening. Trend-following wizards have been coming back to life. Most were positive for 2014, and I would think 2015 is off to a good start. Another sign QE is losing its traction. Yeah, I think the MDM was up 10% uh, last year, something like that. And uh, so, yeah, some some of the trend followers are, are coming back to life. You know, if we get a big break to the downside, uh, I think uh, the, hopefully there's a sell signal in there, in there that's pretty valid. Uh, what's your take on all that, Dr. K? You've been following the trend wizards lately? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, finally from you know, 2009 to 2013, they underperformed. In fact, they uh, had an unprecedented string of losing years, which never happened in their trading careers. Uh, and then 2014, the first half, they were not doing well. But then uh, they came back to life in, uh, I think it was like the last, yeah, the last, somewhere in the last half of 2014. And then so far, this uh, 
well, actually, we're not even done with January, so we don't know how they're doing this month, but um, we do know that uh, they did come back to life. Uh, and then so we'll see. We'll see how, you know, they haven't, uh, they haven't been coming back to life for very long, so it's a question of, uh, you know, how much manipulation is, is flowing into the, into the markets. Um, and that answer will, will come clear within the next couple of months. I mean, if these guys can continue to outperform the markets, um, you know, three, four months uh, in a row, then uh, I think there's your clue because they haven't had that kind of string of success um, since really 2000 and 2008. Uh, someone's asking, this morning you said it, Facebook was teetering on the 620. Do you mean when the 6MA crosses a 20MA or do you mean when the MACD exponential crosses? Well, either or. You'll see it teetering. You can see the two of them actually cross very early in the day right here at the same time. So, you know, but remember, this is just a tool. So if you did short that, you might be covering on the move back above, and then here it comes again, and it may be, you've already crossed in the MACD, so it may be ready to blow to the downside. I think it probably is. I think all the good news is out on uh, Facebook, just like I think all the good news is out on Apple. Remember, these stocks always top when the news is great. It's not like somebody rings a bell and they tell you you got to run out of the stock and and uh, head for the hills. I think uh, when things are the, the rosiest and everybody needs to own the stock and it's a sure thing like Baba at 120, uh, I think they're less so. So I think in this case you're running into some potential where uh, this is it and maybe you run into resistance here. But I'd watch Apple. I think you're kind of late stage. You notice how there's this, the ranges on the weekly chart are a lot more volatile than you've seen recently. And that may be telling you something, but I keep an eye on it. I think if you get a failure, it'll pop through the 50-day uh, moving average, and then that'll be all she wrote. But I, I don't think I'd be buying Apple on the basis of this uh, buyable gap up, even though technically it is a buyable gap up, and if you wanted to buy it, you would use the low at 115.31, right where it closed actually yesterday, as a quick stop. So it, there's a good reference point here, but... My thinking is everybody thinks there's a lot more upside in Apple, and it's it's really a sure thing. And I just get the sense that it it probably isn't. And uh, I won't want to see people get burned up on that by thinking it is, and then just sit there when it starts coming in. So if you do buy it, I think you stick to the Bible gap up rules. But I it may not go anywhere. You have anything to talk about on Apple, Dr. K? Well, um, actually, I want to add one more thing on the trend following wizards. I'm just okay, kind of scanning it here, and um, you know, at the by the end of August 2014, uh, they were still underperforming the major averages, but year to date, they were they were clearly in the in the black with a, a cumulative return of about five percent. Um, but so really, it was the last uh, it was the last quarter that uh, I guess with the market coming off and then going straight back up as hard as it did with all that volatility, it allowed the, the Wizards to uh, recapture and, and more than make up for their um, uh, underperformance. Um, now as far as, uh, as far as, um, yeah, well, actually I wanted to say one more thing. Um, with, with this, uh, you know, I'm just looking at, um, thinking and speaking at the same time here, I'm looking at the overall chart formation of, say, the S&P and we see that basically the last three three months of the year, the trend from following wizards uh, came to life. Um, and is that an indication that QE is is finished, uh, that it's not manipulating the markets? Well, I think it is still manipulating the markets. I think the markets want to come off more. Um, you know, when they when they came off at 9.8 percent on the S and P in October, and then another 5 percent in December. Uh, I think it was Q. It was expectations of QE4 and QE around the world that uh, puts a, um, a floor under these markets from, from really selling off any further. You know, and you see the, the markets just go from October to November straight up. And of course, the trend volume wizards can capture those gains, and they did very well. But that doesn't mean that QE isn't driving the system. Uh, I think there's still evidence uh, to the end of the year that QE is trying to push the markets higher in a feeble way. I mean, you look at the last half of December, that was pretty feeble. After the two strong days bounce, it was pretty feeble. And, and now, since then, it's rolling over and getting choppy and volatile, um, which is not healthy for the overall market environment. So I think, um, you know, I, I don't think you can conclude that QE still in some form isn't manipulating the system, even though we don't have QE in the U.S. 
Um, I think it's just that the shape of the pattern allowed the, the trend following, following wizards to, to capture some appreciable gains off that volatility of the market going straight down into, in, in September and then straight back up in October and November. Uh, so we, yeah, I, I would say QE still, unfortunately, in, in its various uh, nefarious forms, um, a manipulator <laughs> to the market. And it's trying to put in a floor, as you can see as I speak, the market's going, going positive on the S&P, um, you know, and that said, though, um, this might, I'm, I, I, I'm checking in real time here, but MDM is very close to going into a, a sell signal, um, you know, it may happen today, may happen tomorrow, but uh, it's, uh, it's not looking good overall for, for the uh, general market uh, health. No, so, I, well, I think after getting hammered yesterday, you know, a bounce here I think can be manufactured. I think that's basically what you're seeing. And we'll see how it plays out. But I think it's just a matter of time. So you want to pick your spots on the short side and uh, be patient. Just wait for them to come into you and then you hit them there. So even if they do, like a lot of these names this morning, we had some punch on the upside and they were shortable as far as I, I was concerned. And I hit them and they're coming in. So I mean, they're still down like Amgen, F5, uh, LRCX, still below where they were shorted. Um, Yahoo's still down in the dump. Somebody wants to short Baba here. Uh, you know, I think you're kind of late there. If you're going to short Baba, it should have been hit the other day when it broke the 100 level here. But then, you know, earnings have come. So now you want to short it here using the high of the day. I guess technically you could, but I don't really see the point in that. There's other things that I think that are in better position. So, and I just I think they're just going to flip the market around like they usually do, and it's headed. It's going to head back to the downside. So just be patient. Uh, INFN. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Apple. And, um, I was going to throw a couple cents in there on on Apple. Um, you know, it's it it. Uh, if you look at the the weekly on this, uh, oh, it's shaping the right side of its cup. Um, it was showing a lot of strength and resilience in that right in the right hand side of the cup. In other words, the market the market would sell off uh, like the Nasdaq would sell off 9.7% in um, in mid 2014. Um, and then it sold off again uh, to the tune of 5.8%. But Apple um, was was forming relatively flat basis, trying to buck that downtrend. Um, so those were subtle clues. Um, and then from uh, the last, uh, the platform well, it formed a platform in uh, September, basically August August through um, through October, and then it bounced off that platform uh, to new highs, uh, hitting a high of. Uh, uh, looks like one one nineteen seventy five, um, and since then it's uh, formed. It's tried to form something semi constructive, uh, in spite of these uh, uh, retreches of treacherous markets. Um, so the question is, will you know? It's it's a slower moving stock because just due to its sheer market cap. I mean, it's nearing seven hundred billion, and um, is it going to have the uh, that, the, the strong uh, trends that we've seen, say in 2009 into you know to 2011, um, it's very doubtful. But uh, that said, it, Apple kind of is the market. So if the market goes higher, it'll probably go higher with it. If the market has trouble, um, if it's if it, it may uh, at best uh, form one of these sideways platforms like it did uh, twice in 2014. Um, but uh, yeah, you're not going to get a huge bang for your buck in the stock. I mean, it's just it's just so institutionalized uh, that um, you know you, you just buyer beware. You know, there's nothing. If you want to, if you want to get, if you think the market's going higher and you want to play it really uh, conservatively and safe, in, in the sense that uh, the stock isn't um, isn't hugely volatile, uh, then I suppose you could try try your hand at it. But again, the markets are not looking uh, particularly sanguine, so um, you know you got to be careful with any any stock that you're dealing with on the long side. Someone's asking, is INFN still in play? Why are you asking me? I mean, can't you figure this one out? You have a Bible gap up here. The low is 1636. You're trading at 1636 right now. Four days after the Bible gap, have nothing's going on. So, you know, are you going to buy the pullback here on low volume? And, and if you want to do that, what's your stop? It's pretty much that simple. So I don't understand why someone has to ask me if this is still in play. Starbucks is uh, hanging in there after the Bible gap up. It's a slow stock. I wouldn't be surprised to see it uh, pull back and retest the low. But it's not going anywhere. And uh, it is a market stock. So if the market breaks, this probably come in. 
I kind of like the idea here because you're coming out of this big uh, big base, but I have to admit I shorted it yesterday up here and it's coming a little bit uh, and bouncing today, but I, you know, I don't know. It's neither here nor there for me right now in terms of uh, shortable or long. It's just kind of flopping around here and holding in here. But now you're four days after the Bible gap. I mean, it's just kind of sitting there. So I don't know if it's got big upside. I think there's potentials we were talking about with uh, the mobile pay because they want to expand in that area. And they've been uh, talking about uh, maybe partnering with somebody. But also Apple's got a huge lead in that. And that may be just a commoditized uh, business going forward. So it's, it's not clear to me, but the Bible Gap is still in play. I would, if I was going to buy it, though, I'd try to buy it closer to 86.44 on the pullback. So, anyways, um, could you explain how FB has a base failure? Not sure I see that. Scotty, I'm I'm ashamed that you're asking me that question. It's pretty simple. Here's the base breakout right here. See the base? There's a breakout attempt. It failed. It's a base failure. It blows below the 50-day and rallies back up above the 50-day. Notice it catches resistance right at this peak. And that's all she wrote. And that, so that's the failure. The breakout fails. So the breakout, number one, doesn't hold. Then it blows through the 50-day, bounces back up. Notice you get resistance around the 20-day. And then the second time beyond, it gets resistance at this peak. So that's a, fa a base failure. And you can look at it here on a weekly chart. Here's the base. There's the breakout. It stalls and it fails. So that's the base failure. Is that clear, Scotty? You got that? Okay. We can go into in, uh, go into it in more detail when you're out here for dinner. So uh, in March. Um, somebody says another IBD classic. A friend of mine subscribes to IBD stocks breaking out and stocks near pivots. He pointed out PAYC two days ago. I told him when it breaks, sell into it. He said, oh, no, it is going higher. Look at it today. Yeah, I think this is telling you something about the market. Uh, it failed. We looked at these uh, on Sunday, and they looked like they were breaking out. The other one was ADP, and it failed. So, But, again, you don't, you, I wouldn't listen to what IBD says, you know, unless you want to lose money. They, the, the rules just don't work right now. And it's such an old, rigid system that I just don't think it has the same authority that it did in the past. And, and you know, I don't say this out of spite or a vindictiveness. It's just what it is, okay? And, and what outrages me is that they will not adjust, and they just continue to feed people, and I think they feed into people's greed with this idea that it's easy money. Use Can Slim, and it's easy money. And here, we'll write a book about Can Slim success stories, uh, although... We'll never write a book about can slim disaster stories, which I think would be a much, much more instructive book because it shows you what happens when people screw it up or the system doesn't work for you. And that's much more valuable and is the main reason why in our first book we had an entire chapter devoted to our mistakes because that's where you learn the most. And the idea of just throwing something up, can slim success stories, to me just feeds into people's greed and the idea that it's easy money. And it's not. And that, that bothers me, you know. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe they they got to sell newspapers and they got a bunch of parrots. Uh, even Scotty, I think, has become, uh, Scott O'Neill, I think he's just become the chief parrot. And all they're doing is parroting what they've been told to say, reading the books, and nobody's really doing any original thought over there anymore. And it's kind of disturbing to me, but, uh, you know, say la vie, that's, that's the way the world, adapt or die, I choose to adapt. And I think also the fact that if you call them up and ask them what a pocket pivot is, they deny it exists, which I think is another narrow-minded, sort of deliberately um, proprietary uh, sort of thing because they don't want to admit that someone else might have a better way of buying stocks because they're so invested in this rigid system. And I, I think that ultimately will lead to uh, failure. So, and, and I just hate seeing people get chopped up, and I, I just get too many emails from people who get their head handed to them using uh, Canslim these days. So, anyways. But, yeah, the paychecks, that's classic. Somebody says, best wizards were up 30% plus, measly compared to Gil, yeah. But just don't jinx me, okay? we got a new year. Last year's over. What I did last year, I don't care about anymore. Um, just like I don't care about doing, making the 11,000% from 97 to 2000. That's pretty irrelevant at this point. And uh, you got to stay in the present because every year is a new year. Why don't you short oil stocks? 
uh, kind of a dumb question because I do. And if you were following me on the webinars back here, we were talking about Silica Holdings as a short. That's an oil-related name. Another one that I talked about on the webinars that we shorted uh, as it was breaking down here. And I thought the other day, last week, we talked about it as a short right here at the 50-day, and it has come down from there. So I do short oil-related stocks. You're just not paying attention. So... I think it was the currencies gave them their last Q performance. Who was that? Apple? Can you, Mike, can you clarify that? Um, the straight down action in commodities, currencies, and yields around the world also played a large role in the outperformance by the Wizards in the last three months of the year. So they were shorting those names. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's see. Is the MDM strictly a computer model, or do you put some human judgment into it? I don't know. What do we use there? Uh, Paradise. Uh, we roll the bones. Right, Dr. K? Um, huh. Throw a crystal ball in there or two. <laughs> yeah, so that all works. You know, it's uh, obviously um, you know it's a it's it's a model that looks at buying and selling pressure based on price volume action of leaders, leading stocks, and and um, and major indices. And you know, it it has some secondary indicators associated with it, which all get different weightings accordingly. Um, you know, one example would be well, how many how many stocks have leadership quality potential? Or, or our actual leaders that are forming constructive basing patterns and looking about to break out. Obviously, that would be a huge, uh, a huge factor um, that weighs into uh, the model going into going into a buy signal. Um, case in point would be um, uh, October of 1998 when the market looked like it was about to fall apart. Uh, but straight off the bottom, I think within three days. Uh, the model shifted to a buy signal simply because the best stocks, even though the, the NASDAQ, I think it sold off like 36% off its peak very quickly, the best stocks held their ground and were already setting up ready to blast off. And those were like the stocks like Yahoo and Amazon, you know, the stocks that were new stocks back then in 1998. So, um, you know, that was a very, very uh, big clue. And so, you know, the model's obviously Weighing, weighing in various factors and uh, into its uh, soup bowl, and then um, coming up with with a uh, final tally on whether it uh, it stays in cash or goes to buy or goes to sell. Yeah, I think my favorite uh, way of figuring out the market is this way. So I love that song. I'm sorry, I just had to play that. Um, but that's my favorite indicator, you know. Anyways, uh, blah, 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 let's see. When shorting, is the uptick rule still in effect? Huh? The uptick rule, I don't think there is an uptick rule anymore. In some stocks, I think when they break 10%, they institute the uptick rule. So put out a short, you know, above the market or, or hit, the, hit the bid on a short and you'll see real quickly. When short, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I, why are you asking me about what the, you know, the rules on the NYSE and the OTC? Go ask them. So, but, but my understanding is there's no uptick rule unless the stock is down, trading down fast, you know, 10% or something, and then it kicks in. But go on the websites and find out. Oh, did I have the wrong stock? In I'm sorry. That, that was a PAYX. Yes, it's breaking down, too, so. Um, PAYC, and that's not working either. Yeah, I see that they see a double bottom breakout. That's not, yeah, but again, uh, breakouts don't work. End of story. So we know that. Somebody says Scott O'Neill's a dude. Yeah, well, he's a nice guy. Look, I'm not, and I'm not criticizing. I just don't think he really has that much market expertise. And Dr. K had to train him. I don't know. Did you get some impression of a, a brilliance? Any brilliance there, Dr. K? Well, yeah, he's a nice guy, um, and, and Bill asked me if I could uh, sit with him uh, at least once a week and answer his questions and basically walk him through uh, my thought processes um, in how I trade the markets. And he's a diligent student, and he's certainly devoted, and he has the right attitude. Uh, he's a lot of good qualities, but when it comes down to the ab absolute talent, is he a genius? Is he a market genius? Is he a trading genius? Absolutely not. Um, you know, in fact, he, he possesses a lot of traits that Ed Sekota would say, um, you know, 
you're better off either not trading or if you're going to trade, trade with small amounts and uh, you know don't expect to blow the doors off uh, off your performance figures ever because you don't have the uh, right characteristics to get you know that triple digit year. But and would also say, okay, this guy's on the conservative side. Um, that's his nature. He's probably not going to blow up his account either. But he's certainly not going to be any sort of market wizard. No. So you know, but what? And that's nothing against Scott. I, <laughs> I, I I like Scott. I always liked Scott a lot. Um, you know, but uh, it's just it's just the facts of the matter. You know, Ed Sakota is known for being quite brutal in his assessment of of potential students that wanted to, him to train them up. You know, yeah, it's better to be to be uh, to be exactly um, cutting when you need to be. You know, otherwise they might not get the point that they shouldn't trade. Yeah. So the bottom line is, they don't look at him as some sort of guru that you need to follow. So my view is, anybody who's doing this right is trying to empower people to make their own decisions, and that that's something I try to do, and that I insist that people do. And you guys see me get perturbed when someone tries to ask me, you know, should I make this trade? Uh, what should I do here? You know, it, it's it, that I, I don't like to see that because I want to see people empowered to make their own decisions and not rely on so-called gurus or what they market as a veteran trader and all this other BS. So, anyways, uh, I would read Ed Sekota's Trading Tribe book if you want to get more uh, knowledge about Ed Sekota. And again, the other book that I'm recommending that everybody read, which I think is should be required reading, is called Trade Mindfully by Gary Dayton, D-A-Y-T-O-N. I think that's an outstanding book. I'm in the middle of reading it. Uh, it talks about a lot of things that I've sort of uh, been picking up recently and uh, have helped me do pretty well. See how the market's starting to roll over here? They, they're just sucking people in. They, get, they bounce it, they sell it, they bounce it, bring some dumb money in, and then they're going to roll it over again. I think you break lower later in the day. We'll see if I'm right. Um, VA, we're looking at this. Uh, VA is a piece of garbage and uh, easily manageable. Sure. Well, you would have been better off shorting it up near the 20-day. Not At this point, you're kind of extended, but it looks pretty crappy, and I don't think that you can borrow it, though. I think that's the main issue here. Um, somebody says, yes, Mindfully is one of the most important trading books I've read. Thank you. Trading in the zone is a good one. Someone mentions that, but I think this, is, uh, this one is beyond trading in the zone. You, have you gotten it, Dr. K, yet? Have you read it? Trading in the Zone. No, Trade Mindfully. No, no, I don't have that one yet. Okay, that's one I think you uh, you should get. Uh, you put it on your iPad or whatever. Put it in the queue. I've got about 13 books in the queue, but I'll put that in, like, number five. <laughs> there you go. There. <laughs> Make it 14 now. Um, so yeah, that's a great book, I think. I want to go back to uh, Workday. I'm looking at the low here at 75.23 as a potential short-term target. But that's this low here, but I think ultimately it could get to there after earnings come out. Tesla, piece of garbage. Uh, rallies, undercuts the low, and that's a cover point, okay, uh, if you short it up here short term. And rallies to the 20-day, finds resistance, picks up volume yesterday and coming in. Uh, I think Merrill Lynch came out with a bearish report on the stock. Uh, basically reiterating pretty much all of the concepts we've already covered in our webinars um, and much higher in the pattern it was up here around 250 so uh, you can see this could have seen this coming a while ago but now a head and shoulders type top and it's just kind of a rolling pattern to the downside can't get above the 50 day so I think ultimately any rallies up to the 50 day or the, the 10 week line here on the weekly chart would be shortable uh, let's see any more questions you guys think about these now we got about six minutes left I don't know. I'm seeing some things rally up in some areas. I want to hit them on the short side, things I've been watching here. Um, let's look at, uh, hmm. Now we talked about Trip. We talked about Tesla. talked about Facebook. Okay, here, I'll throw this and maybe this little radical. I think you're going to get into a point with the market where you can short anything. You throw darts and short anything, it's going to come in. So stocks that are stuck straight up in the air, uh, like software tool or, or software, Sol Skywork Solutions, I'm sorry. I always get those two mixed up. Uh, this may be a short and come back in. Just watch the 620 on it. Let's take a look at that. Here it is, rallying, rallying. So you're about to cross here. Notice how as you're moving higher, 
that you're, you're running out of gas on the MACD, and when that happens, sometimes that, that's where the rally runs out, and you're starting to cross through. But it, so you see if I'm right, maybe this one rolls in, but I think you're going to get into a position with the market where uh, everything comes down, so you just throw darts. Uh, somebody asks, do you ever short weakness anymore? I never did, actually. So e.g. on a 30-minute chart, are you 100% shorting bounces? I'm generally 100% shorting bounces. Uh, into resistance just because it's a much easier way to operate yeah, you're yeah. you're in too much danger of getting whipsawed out of a position when uh, you're shorting into uh, weakness and everybody sees it remember you're in a QE market the an ugly duckling market when everything looks really bad and everybody wants to go short on something and it's come down for a ways or starting to break resistance you uh, you risk too much uh, uh, of, of the possibility of getting whipped out. And, and, you know, look here, I remember a lot of people wanted to come after Tesla here. And while it's a tradable move on, based on the gap down and it forms a bear flag, you could use a high this day as your stop, 195.74, but you would have been stopped out right there pretty quickly. So, you know, you have to think about some of these things. Where are they in within their pattern? That's the primary uh, concern when I'm watching these things rally. Are they rallying into an area of potential resistance? This rally here to the neckline of this head and shoulders roughly you can see that and this rally comes into the 20 day and then when you're breaking down here everybody sees it and everybody wants to get short the stock and by that time it's just too late and uh, and so that's why I like to look for these types of rallies the other thing is I can clearly see where the potential short points are and if you read the new book when it comes out we actually have the final proof pages back hopefully Dr. K you're getting a chance to look through those and see if there's any last minute changes although I think we were pretty yeah. thorough I think we were pretty thorough on the last round, and we've been pretty thorough in terms of overall area yeah. errors, errors rather. Um, and so it's much easier to hit the rallies uh, rather than trying to come after weakness. Okay, and that's I don't ever short weakness, and I think if you do, you're something of a panda, uh, just kind of getting excited because you see something breaking, and you just got to get short. You have to anticipate, and I'm real big on that. Uh, short selling requires anticipation, and I, when I talk about it, uh, the new book goes into a huge amount of detail on how you short and where you short, and it's all mostly on daily charts. That was the big flaw in the How to Make Money Selling Stock short book that I ghost wrote for Bill O'Neill, and that which was published in 2004. There's nothing but weeklies, and that's bogus. But to me, that's the IBD style. You know, just show a weekly chart and say short here when there's so much more to it. Than that, and a lot of the neckline breaks when something breaks down through a neckline, those occur on gap down moves. Okay, so for example, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to Netflix's last top. When was that, Dr. K? Was that like 2012? I think it was when it blew apart. And see, here's the. Let's see. Nope, 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 nope. No, here it is. Okay. Here's a, yeah, really a what they'll do is they'll show a head and shoulders and they'll draw a neckline here and then they'll say they'll draw an arrow here short here. Well, there's only one problem with that is that you really can't short here because it had gapped down. And then at that point it could be seen as, as too extended, but if we institute the shortable gap down concept, then it becomes shortable on the daily chart. And that depends on where it gaps down, where it sets up as far as an intraday high. Uh, you know, GMCR is another situation like that if we go back to this top, you know, and they can draw a line across here and say short here, and that's in October of what, 2012 or 2011 rather. So we go back on the daily chart. Uh, see, market's starting to roll in now. Nasdaq's now down 13 again. Uh, you know, it doesn't look so hot to me, so I'm not ready to be buying. Anyways, this would have been the the head and shoulders here, okay, in here. And there's a supposedly a short point, but it's a gap down. Now, we actually picked this one off right here, I think it was, um, in, a, in a report uh, that we sent out on this. About, you had the gap down here and then the break uh, rally up to the 20-day. It's around, I think it's things split since then. I'm not sure, but I think we hit that pretty well. Uh, let's see. Grub, did you see earnings release date of February 5th? Yeah, they, they did, but notice this thing's not doing anything. It's broken the 50-day. There's no reason to even bother with it. And like I said, there's no reason to even bother with the long side of this market as far as I'm concerned. Yes, take note of pocket pivots as you see them in real time. Those may be stocks that you want to keep on your buy watch list if the market's able to get going. But 
I, in a lot of stuff, this this looks like garbage to me now. Um, I'm not interested in it. Let's. I don't know if I can give you guys anything else. CNX. I think this stock's going lower. Uh, it might be shortable here. We're looking for a break down the turn today. We covered this last week. Um, some of the oil stocks. For you know, if you want to look at some of these, maybe it's shortable. Notice how it rallies past the 50-day, but it it finds resistance right at the high of this gap down day on the on the trading range there. So kaboom right there. Um, somebody tell me what would be your favorite oil name to short right now if you're looking at any. Come on, out with it. It's 9.31. We've already been going for an hour. We're going to answer a couple of questions and then I'm out of here. I'm trying to make some money. Nope, nothing? Okay. But like I said, you know, we talked about silica a long time ago, and if you were on it right in here, you know, it, that was a great short, probably better than a lot of the oils. So, SLB, slob, Schlumberger. Yeah, there you go. Well, I think this is a lot like silica if you go back and look at the pattern. Here's the head and shoulders. There's the right shoulder. Notice how it's very choppy and sloppy, and that's an indication of trouble brewing. And sure enough, it breaks. Now you're at the, you hit the 50-day again. Or I'm sorry, the 10 week, which uh, not quite up to the 50 day, but that's that's a piece of garbage now. It's probably going lower. I think a lot of these names are going lower. I think the whole market's going lower. So, like I said, you'd probably be able to just throw darts. Fang, Fang Dang Sweet Poon Tang, one of my favorite names, uh, just for the symbol. Yeah, this one might be shortable. Notice here, sort of this head and shouldersy sort of thing. It's a big rolling one, but more of a late stage base breakup failure here. All the way up to the uh, 40-week line almost. But notice how it doesn't quite get to the line, but you see it, it goes past the 50. But where does it go to? See these highs over here on this side? It rallies right up into those highs. It's a very important concept on the short side. So, And it's something I talk about in the book. But reference points, reference points on rallies. So if they go past the moving average, then you're looking for a prior price peak as a spot to potentially short a stock. Uh, and in this case, yeah, that would work. And maybe this does roll over. Maybe it goes a lot lower. That does look pretty putrid. I'm not so sure you can... Eh, maybe if you wanted to try it today, use the high of the day as your quick stop. It's about... Uh, right now it's at 65.99. And uh, the high of the day is 67.68. That's eh, 3 4%. How many percent is that? Like 4% higher, Dr. K? Something like that. Chevron, CDX... Yeah, another one looking poopy. That's, uh, but that you know, a lot of these have broken down a lot, so you're looking for things that might be in a fresher position. I think the Fang looks interesting. Isn't there a couple of like uh, Bonanza Creek? Yeah, that's already toast. Uh, help me out, you guys. What other ones? EOG. Uh, yeah, that's one that looks like uh, it's ready to blow to the downside from here. Would have been shortable up here, right around the 50-day. But a lot of these do look weak. And you have to ask yourself, is that positive for the market? Yes. I don't think so. Anyways, you guys, oh, Chesapeake, one last one before we blow out of here. Yeah, there's another one. Uh, but, again, it's way down there. But it doesn't mean it can't go lower, and it's only 18 bucks. I'd look for something maybe a little higher in the pattern. So, anyways, we'll see how today close. I don't like this market. I'm not really uh, interested in anything on the long side here. Uh, you know, keep things on your buy watch just in case the market finds its feet. But I'm guessing unless the Fed comes through with something radical like QE4, uh, this market's probably hitting lower. So we'll see if I'm right. You know, maybe I'm wrong. But that won't be the first time. So anyways. Uh, yeah, the model's tilting in that direction as well. Um, you know, and I don't, I'm not expecting the Fed to be making any sudden announcements since they just completed their two-day meeting. So they left a bad tone, a bad taste in people's uh, mouths, you know. And I think... Uh, the trend right now it's pointing lower and uh, you know prior to prior to today it's been very sloppy and that's uh, generally doesn't bode well for markets going forward no so anyways I already talked about GLD I wouldn't be messing with precious metals because you, if they start selling this market off everything goes every asset class will go and that will take gold down as well and on top of that you're not seeing gold really holding up very well here. It's broken below the 200 day. So you don't even want to go there, Scotty. Got it? All right, that's all we got, you guys. Thanks for showing up, as always, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Take care. So long, everyone.